Hey guys, welcome back to the shop for another Metallurgy Monday. I appreciate your support on the channel with this endeavor. This is where we go in depth into the steel, the heat treating, the metallurgy, but we're gonna boil it all down to a very practical application for you and your shop so you can take your projects to the next level. Today we're gonna to talk about cracked blades when quenching. If you've ever, have, ever had a blade crack in the quench or right out of the quench, super frustrating. And then you have a rune blade or a shorter blade, no fun anyway. So little caveat here or parameters, I'm talking about a blade that does not have any prior defects. Now, this is important because there are certain things that can cause defects or cracks in a blade that don't show up until later after the quench. And so you may think that the quench caused it. This is important, but it is a subject for another video. Some things that can cause defects or cracks in a blade during the forging process would be heating the steel too hot, forging the steel too hot, or forging the steel too cold. Some steels are more susceptible to this than others, so it's important to know your steel. But what we're talking about today is a blade that has no prior defects, and you go into the quench, everything is good prior to that, come out of the quench, and you've got a cracked blade. We don't want that, so we're gonna talk about how to avoid that. To help explain what we're talking about today, I'm going to use a simple version of a triple T diagram. Triple T stands for time, temperature, and transformation. And what this is, is a bunch of information on, a, on an actual triple T diagram. There's a lot of different information. We're not even gonna begin to get into most of it. We're just gonna use this to uh, explain some basic concepts here. But a lot of information that has to do with how the steel reacts within a time and temperature continuum and the different things that it does, how it transforms, the phases that it goes into and all that kind of thing. Each steel is going to have its own specific triple T diagram because depending on the carbon content, the alloy content, the steel is gonna react very differently or significantly differently so that the information is gonna be different and specific to each steel. This is just an illustrative version and uh, we're, we're gonna use this to explain some things. So you've got your time down here. This is actually exponential, not linear. And so you've got like one, five, 10, 100, something like that seconds. And then it you know, quickly goes uh, very, very high. And so these things are short periods of time and then a long period of time very quickly, exponential. Temperature, up around here, it's typically something around 1500 degrees. That's not really what's crucial today. What I want you to do is look up a triple T diagram for your specific steel after we have explained what's going on here. If you've ever heard people talk about missing the perlite nose or the perlite nose, this is what they're talking about here. These lines here indicate how the steel behaves over a period of time in, in the temperature continuum. On this side of the uh, perlite nose, you've got austenite and then martensite, but on this side, you have the potential for perlite. Perlite is not a suitable blade, uh, uh, phase of steel for a blade. You don't want that in your knife. It's not a good edge uh, holding or, or even the toughest phase of steel necessarily, it's not good. We don't want perlite in our blade, particularly in the edge. And that's what we're talking about specifically. When you uh, quench a blade, you have to bring the temperature down from austenitizing temperature somewhere up here, down quick enough to miss this spot here on, known as the perlite nose. Otherwise you're going to have some amount of perlite in your steel, which we don't want. Now. The time here is going to tell you in line with the perlite nose how much time you have to actually miss that perlite nose. What's important to know is that the way you get full potential hardness on your steel when it comes to the quenching temperature is to miss this perlite nose. Now there are other factors to the condition of the carbon or carbides in the steel, alloy components, different things like that that we're not going to get into today. But just when it comes to the quench speed, you've got to miss that perlite nose, otherwise you will have perlite in your steel and you're going to lose some hardness and you're gonna lose some edge retention and things like that, which is not what we want. For example, on a 1095 steel, you're gonna have this perlite nose right up real close to the zero point start line. So you've got literally less than a second to cool that steel down to avoid any perlite forming in your steel. However, once you've missed that perlite nose, whatever that requires, depending on your specific steel and the particular chemical composition of that steel, once you've missed that perlite nose, we don't need to cool the steel at the same rate, okay? We don't need to 
This doesn't need to drop like a rock and, and be down to ambient or room temperature within like five or 10 seconds. That's not necessary. Once we've missed this perlite nose, that cooling rate can slow way down and we can let this just real gently and very slowly cool down over, you know, 30 minutes or whatever to uh, ambient temperature. That is not going to affect the hardness of your steel whatsoever. What's important, again, is to miss that perlite nose. Once you've achieved that, it can cool down very slowly comparatively and you're still going to achieve full potential hardness. One caveat to that, any martensite that is forming in the blade may be auto-tempered from the residual heat in your blade. Practically speaking, that's really not an issue because you're going to come back and temper higher than and more than that anyway. Unless you've got way too much residual heat in your blade, then that's just going to be a problem overall. We're going to talk about how to avoid that. But you'll notice down here I've got a line that says MS. This is the martensite start line. And so in between here and here, you're not actually creating any martensite until the temperature of the steel starts to get down into here somewhere. And then sometimes you'll see a martensite finish on the, on the uh, diagram, but a lot of times it'll be way down below here temperature wise that you're not even gonna see it on there. And that's where you have completed almost the full martensitic transformation. But the martensite start line is where you're actually starting to create martensite. So in between you know, here and here, you're just waiting for the steel to cool down and that does not need to be speedy. And this is why it's important because what causes blades to crack in general is the stresses that are created between here and here, not here and here. Because between here and here, you're still austenitic. We've removed enough of the energy from the steel that the carbon that has now been trapped in that austenitic phase cannot uh, migrate back out but it's still austenite until you get down somewhere down into here. And so we don't have to cool the steel at a super fast rate. And if we do, we're going to uh, greatly increase the chance of cracking. Now, on a very practical level, how do you achieve this? Well, you could probably get like a, a laser thermometer or something like that and, and check to see what this temperature is to miss the perlite nose on your specific steel. And, and I haven't actually tried that, but what I do in my shop, and I'll share it with you, is I will quench the blade until when I pull it out, it's still smoking, it's still pretty hot, too hot to touch certainly, but the oil that is on the surface of the blade is not evaporating, at least not within several seconds. So it's still, pull it out, still smoking, but there's still a sheen or a film or a layer of oil on the blade that is not evaporating off. As it's smoking, it's going to eventually evaporate off, but within several seconds, it's not evaporating off. And that's how I, on a, just a very practical level, make sure that I've removed enough heat from the blade to miss the perlite nose, not have too much residual heat, so to run the risk of over auto tempering, but it's not anywhere cooled down to here, and so it can slowly move down into the martensitic transformation. That's how I do it. Very, very practical, um, straightforward way. You're probably gonna have to practice this practice this a little bit because there is sort of a range in there where it's still smoking a little bit but you've actually cooled it down a little bit too much and now you're stiffening things up. That's not really a huge issue unless you want to use this period of time in between here to straighten the blade which is the next thing I want to talk about. One big advantage of quenching your blades like this is that you do have the ability to really work with that steel in between here and move it around a, quite a lot. It's still quite pliable and this is going to depend a little bit on the alloy content of your specific steel and which, which one you're working with specifically. But in general, with the high carbon steels, you have quite a lot of uh, pliability as it's cooling down prior to uh, martensitic conversion. You can do straightening on that blade, which is, can be very helpful depending on, on the blade and you know, how it's reacting to the quench. So this is just a very practical application that I use all the time, have used it for years, and I think I can count the number of cracked blades that I've had on one hand. I would um, say specifically for this, uh, because of this uh, methodology. So hopefully that's helpful to you guys in your shop, and I appreciate you watching. We'll see you next time on another Metallurgy Monday.